Hva skal til for at veksten i fornybar energi i Europa skal fortsette? Og hvilke forretningsmodeller trengs? Det skal vi få høre mer om fra Group Senior Vice President i Vestas Wind Systems. Vær så god, Morten Albeck. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been looking forward to having the opportunity to speak to you the next uh, 15 minutes. Now, I'm fully aware of what I've been invited to come and speak about, namely emerging business models to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. But allow me to start somewhere different, namely with, with this guy. He would have turned 100 years this very week if he was still alive, but he died 57 years ago. I don't know whether anybody knows who he is. I thought so. It's okay. You know who Britney Spears is, but you do not know who Albert Camus is. Now, his favorite quote, and a quote that he put in the epicenter of his philosophy and his literature, is the one that I have up here on the slide. The heart, the heart has its reasons, which reasons does not know. The heart has its reasons that reasons do not know. What does that have to do with emerging business models to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy? Everything. In my book, absolutely everything. Because we need to rethink logic. We need to rethink what is reasonable. We need to rethink sensibility. And I believe that my generation is the first generation that will conclude firmly and eternally that there is no reason, there's no logic, there's no purpose, there's no future in the one-eyed short-term profit-maximizing capitalism that it has shown in history that it has no future. I also believe that my generation will be the first generation that will also conclude that there is no sensibility, there's no logic, there's no reason in the naive philanthropical orthopistic humanism because we have seen in history that when we try to outlive the humanistic vision it doesn't become humanism it becomes all other types of isms fascism narcissism communism so i believe that my generation is the first generation that whether we are politicians business leaders citizens consumers are insisting that these two isms has to merge and no longer be polarized because standing alone they have no future, they have no meaning, they have no reason. So I believe, and my company believe, in capitalistic humanism. And when you merge these two essence, and energy evolves, a sweet spot is created, which is an innovative sweet spot for new business models, new commercial innovation. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I call capitalistic humanistic commercial innovations. Now, today, in the Danish equivalent, to Næringslivet, the following was published based on a rumor, and I can of course not confirm it since we are on the Copenhagen Stock Exchange. But it's a story about a rumor that Microsoft is acquiring Vestas wind turbines, 110 megawatt of Vestas wind turbines. That has an equivalent, if that rumor is true, of more than one billion Norwegian kroner in revenue to my company. Now, on top of this, we have also sold our technology to Google and to IKEA for several billion of Norwegian kroner in the last two years to a business segment that simply did not exist in my business, the business of wind, 36 months ago. We more or less invented them, not Microsoft or Google or IKEA, but them of, as clients to our business. We call them a carbon conscious corporation Corporations that do not have power generation as their core business. Because one thing is that Microsoft is investing, potentially, in Vestas technology. And thereby actually greening up how they run their business and becoming more sustainable. But of course it's needed for consumers and citizens to know about it. So therefore, we've also invented WinMate, the first ever consumer label endorsed by the UN for a single energy source. Which means that a new future is coming to Oslo, to Stockholm, to Copenhagen, to Beijing and to Mumbai to any city in the world, namely a reality where consumers can go into the supermarket and can make a choice between a packet of cereals produced 
with oil or wind, oil made cereals or wind made cereals. And I'm telling you, we may sometimes believe when we look out of the window that mankind is born unsensible. But when you're given the choice between a wind made packet of cereals and an oil made packet of cereals, I was started showing one thing, and that is you'll make the sensible choice. Now, I'm talking about capitalistic humanism as a new innovation foundation for commercial ideas, vehicles, and projects. So let me tell you a little story. Two and a half years ago, I was reading an article about where in the world is at the highest likelihood of dying before you turn five. The exact same day as I was reading that article, some engineers from IBM was flown in from the States to the headquarters of SS Wind Systems in Denmark to upgrade what at that time was probably the sixth largest commercial supercomputer. The others was owned by NSA or the Chinese Army. And that one computer standing in the basement of the mainland of Denmark is a computer that is capable of predicting how the wind is going to blow for plus 10 years down to 10 times 10 meters with 99% likelihood. And then it struck me if anybody had ever combined these two data sets, namely where in the world are children living with the highest likelihood of dying before they turn five and where the wind is going to blow the most stable for the next coming decades. And I called my guys and the innovation team and said, there's probably somebody that's done this before, but just check it out if anybody had ever combined these two data sets. And we found out that nobody ever had, so we chose to do so. And we found out that out of the 1.3 billion people that are living as hostages of energy poverty, 100 million of those are living with the one resource spinning around their head that is the key to get them out of that hostage of poverty, namely energy, namely wind energy. So we decided that we wanted to innovate a technology solution that made it possible for us to bring wind energy to the most remote poor places on the planet, and thereby we created the initiative Wind for Prosperity, which we are launching and announcing in New York on the 26th of November, and until then, it's a deep, deep secret. Now, let me give you a concrete example of what this actually does. Let's start in Kenya, where we're going to deploy to 13 villages, 13 villages where 200,000 Kenyans will get access to electricity that they do not have access to today. We will lower the cost of energy in these societies with two-thirds, with more than 66%, so the electricity is going to be much, much cheaper. Secondly, we're going to save the air of Kenya for 2,000 tons of petroleum. And that's a lot of trucks with petroleum that's not going to drive on the roads of Kenya. And the beauty, the true poesy is that we're achieving these two things while we at the same time is earning money, high margins, actually higher than we do on our core business. So it's not philanthropy, it's not corporate aid, it's not CSR, it's not even sustainability, it's pure business development. And now that we're talking about how we innovate new business models that can make the acceleration of renewable energy go faster, then I just want you to remember one-third, one-third, one-third. One-third of the population on the planet that have access to electricity today get their electricity from diesel generation, the most polluting resource you can find. One-third are getting it either from a combination of gas and diesel, and then the last one-third get it from the full suite of energy sources. And then we still have the 1.3 billion people that are living without access to electricity. So the opportunity in deploying these solutions are huge also from a business perspective. Now, Wind for Prosperity is the biggest, fastest deployation of high-tech green technology to the poor world ever undertaken. We'll bring these solutions to 1.3 million people in 100 communities inside three years, so it's not a long stretch, meaning some target about doing something great in 2050 where the majority of the people in this room will anyway be dead. It's about actually making a commitment that is so firm and it's going to be realized so soon that it's going to be extremely damaging for my company and my own personal reputation if it does not succeed. 
I think that we are dying slowly on this planet of big, hairy targets thrown into the next century. We need short-term commitments. Now, again, when we talk about business models, the growth, and one could say, ain't it just, you could say, a clever way of generating a lot of brand equity and a marketing stunt, and then on the side of that, you're also earning a little bit of money, is still small-scale business. But where's the growth in the energy consumption going to be? It's not going to be in the old world where we are sitting. It's going to be in Tanzania. It's going to be in Kenya. It's going to be in Nicaragua. It's going to be in Myanmar. It's going to be in Vietnam. It is in the new world, exactly where Wind for Prosperity is going. So Wind for Prosperity is also a Trojan horse to get a foothold in the future growth markets for my company. So let's end where I started. By the Albert Camus quote, that love has a reason that reason do not understand. We simply need to rethink our logic. We need to rethink capitalism. We need to rethink humanism. And we need to rethink the way that we innovate. Because the fact of the matter is, it's absolutely possible to earn a lot of money extremely fast and at the same time truly make a positive impact for millions and millions and millions of people's life quality. And when that is the case, one should question any board, any executive management team, why that isn't in the core of how they run their business. Thank you for inviting Adain to speak to you. Good luck with life and love. Thank you.